This episode is brought to you by Sprout Living. One of our favorite new snacks are Sprout Living's probiotic almonds. Wildly delicious and irresistibly crunchy, these are the perfect gut-healthy balanced snack. Each pack of the sprouted and activated organic almonds contain 10 billion CFUs of probiotics, 6 grams of clean plant protein, and a variety of other superfood spices and herbs that do the body good. They're made without seed oils, which we all know are out. And the flavors, the Italian truffle is delicious and the dairy-free cheddar cheese made with turmeric and nutritional yeast always hits the spot. Honestly, we may never have another chip again. Sprout Living also makes our favorite plant-based protein blends. My personal favorite is the coffee flavor. If you want to try Sprout Living, you can save 20% off your entire order by using code COURAGEOUS at checkout. Visit www.sproutliving.com and use code COURAGEOUS to save 20%. Give them a try and let us know if you love them as much as we do. You can also find the direct links in our show notes. Welcome to Courageous Wellness. My name is Erica Stein. And I'm Allie French, and this is a podcast about individual journeys within wellness and how to navigate it all. After Allie experienced a cancer diagnosis in her 20s, and Erica went through a self-love journey, we created a platform to interview real people from all walks of life that have combined all types of practices. From physical wellness to emotional and spiritual, we hear courageous stories and focus on why it's important to share them. We are both certified integrative nutrition health coaches and together with our community are learning to live our most purposeful lives by sharing one courageous story at a time. It takes courage to share these journeys and by talking about them, we aim to destigmatize the process. We want you to be your own health advocate, feel educated and informed on the latest in health and wellness and empower you to feel your absolute best. And because we want to bring forth a wide variety of stories, the opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect our own, but we hope the diverse and varied stories will empower you to make the best choices for your own life. So join us as we and our community share our courageous wellness. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of Courageous Wellness. We have a wonderful conversation with May Lindstrom today, and her story is really beautiful. We really love her skincare products, and it's going to lead into my update because I've been using her skincare pretty religiously for, I want to say, almost two months now, about, and I have a hormone health update. So if you are a longtime listener of our show, you know that recently we've done a lot of different hormone health episodes from breaking down the menstrual cycle and the four stages to perimenopause, you know, literally to trying to conceive. We've talked a lot about hormones and I've talked a lot about my own luteal phase, right? I really struggle Um, or I can really struggle if I'm not supporting myself with like (laughs) ragey depression during my luteal phase, which can last anywhere from three days to almost the entire two weeks, which can be debilitating when I'm in it. And so I really try to support myself through my luteal phase. Anyway, this brings me again to the skincare, to my what's been changing. So I talked in January in our episode about tapping into our parasympathetic nervous system, about how my chanting practice was really helping my luteal phase, right? Like really tapping into the parasympathetic nervous system. But the last two weeks, so I'm ending my luteal phase now, my cycle is going to start any second. And I have had no, like also zero, zero luteal phase issues. Um, nothing like I'm having a little bit today and I swear it's just cause I'm PMSing cause my period's coming. But the thing that's changed this month, which I know Allie, you've been talking about forever. Yeah. I have cooked, I would say 95% of my meals at home, Yeah, like 95%. And I feel good. I look good. I, and that's what brings me to the skincare. My skin looks amazing. I also had no, no hormonal breakouts this month. Mm. So I don't know if it's May Lindstrom's beautiful skincare or cook. Cause I'm not changing. Like I'm still eating dairy. I'm still eating gluten, right? Like I'm not 
I still eat sugar. Like I'm not eliminating any food group from my my plate, but everything is made at home, you know, yeah. and even my chocolate, I will say like, I love the, the truffle cups from BTR nation who we work with and love. So again, like I'm eating at home and it's yeah. changing my skin, my luteal, and then using my Lindstrom skin on top of it, like the glow. It's just, <laughs> I'm feeling really good. That's and it's great. I couldn't believe it when I realized I was like, Oh, my period's due today. I've had no luteal phase discomfort. I'm having a little bit of PMS today on the day my period's supposed to arrive. That's a huge win. Like, yeah, it is a win. And, and I do think the cooking thing is big. Like I've been trying to do it most of this year so far too, but then I would say like in February, um, end of February went to more like restaurants and stuff. And it's amazing after you like really focus on just kind of the majority of your time eating at home, which is better on the wallet too. Oh yeah. Um, Budgeting queen over here. (laughs) But it's like, it's so funny because then you, you you become more sensitive once you're like, Oh yeah, I'm going to go out tonight. And it's like, Oh, this was fun. But like, I'd wake up feeling gross or, and it's at the end of the day, I think this is the thing. And I love, I'm a foodie. I love the experience of going out to eat. I get all of that. But if we can do that as our once in a while, I Mm -hmm. think you realize how you absolutely have no idea what you're consuming. Even if yeah. you're like, yeah, I'm going to order something that feels, you know, healthful or supportive for my health. You really don't know because you're not preparing it. And so I think that's just something to keep in mind. It's like, yeah, you're going to go out, you're going to have a great time. Cool. Enjoy it for what it is. But if you or one can focus on cooking as much as possible. And I know that feels overwhelming because people have busy lives and jobs and stuff, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be Mm -hmm. simple. You can like, I am a huge fan of meal prepping on a Sunday, cooking a bunch of stuff and like you have it to heat up throughout the week. And it actually cuts down on time ultimately too. So, um, cuts down on money, cuts down on time and cuts down on like additional sort of inflammatory ingredients that we just don't know about. I think that's, yeah. and that's what your luteal kind of experience has shown. So I'm a big yeah. fan of like, let's get together and cook. And if um anybody has any stressors around that, like you're feel free to reach out and I'm happy to give you some kind of like tips that I enjoy um, to help the cooking life be just a little bit easier. It doesn't have to be stressful. It can be, it can be fun. Yeah. So, um, we have a great episode with May. I think we should get into it. Yes, let's do it. So today on the podcast, we have a conversation with May Lindstrom, who grew up with highly sensitive and reactive skin that would erupt in blisters, rashes, spots of eczema, and various forms of dermatitis when out of balance. Her parents eventually discovered that she had a sensitivity to glues, dyes, synthetic fragrance, preservatives, and a long list of irritants. Traditional skincare would wreak total havoc on her complexion, and even many natural ingredients would irritate her skin. As she grew older, her chemical sensitivities continued to increase, and she became more aware of how much her environment affected her well-being. Her solution was to immerse herself in the study of plant medicine and ultimately create formulas targeted to her own challenges and goals. Over the years, May's knowledge, experience, and passion evolved and took on a new focus. The joyful experimentation of her youth carried a very different energy than the years of intense study that followed. She began to focus specifically on creating powerful plant medicine blends that eased the discomfort of more extreme issues, skincare following cancer treatments, chemotherapy and radiation, post-trauma from burns or injury, severe acne, rosacea, and the inflammation of all types that contribute to conditions similar to her own history. After several years of tailoring individual formulas to meet the heightened needs of her bespoke clients, in 2012, May officially launched the May Lindstrom Skin Collection with their first retail partner. This also happened to be the same day that her first child was born. Today, we have a conversation on May's really incredible and beautiful journey that spans many different versions of herself and talk about her truly luxurious, clean, and beautiful skincare line. We love this conversation and really love the products. 
And so if you are new to the very special world of May Lindstrom Skin, this welcome offer that they have offered Courageous Wellness listeners is especially for you. So you can get $80 in gifts. So you can get an $80 gift of their Hero Hydrator, the Jasmine Garden, when you shop $150 or more of their fresh skin food formulas. So you can visit maylindstrom.com and their site is really beautiful. It's incredible informative and really conveys their unique experience. So it's worth just exploring to drool over everything. We use the Youth Dew Serum, the Blue Cocoon, and the Jasmine Garden. So that's kind of been my my own little routine as of late that I talked about in the beginning. So you can add the full-size mist right to your cart along with $150 in other products. So then use code COURAGE at checkout to take $80 off your final total. So details are in the show notes and we hope you fall as hard for everything as we have. Enjoy the episode. Welcome, May. We are very happy to have you today. And just to get us started, can you share with our listeners a little bit about you, a little bit about your background and and how that got you interested in the world of taking care of your skin? Oh, how far back can we go? (laughs) All the way. A lifetime. This is a lifetime for me. This has truly been the work of my life. I turned 40 last year and in my fourth decade, I can zoom out enough to see I have been doing this the whole time. (laughs) Um, To go way, way back, I guess this started as child's play. I was, uh, let me see, I was born in a barn in Northern Minnesota to a couple of original hippies. And they built a little barn on a little piece of land in the middle of nowhere with my infant brother and then had me in said barn six weeks early. I was a footling breech, born at home, and came into the world like that. Uh, slept in a drawer, <laughs> grew up with a particular group of parent friends that were all really in a very special community. Um We weren't farmers, but we were surrounded by farmers. Uh, We traded food with our neighbors. We were a deer hunting family. Um, I was a vegetarian, but I came from a deer hunting family. There was lots of trading with the neighbors and uh, we would grow this and you would grow that and you'd make this soap and we would have this to offer. And um, to give an idea of the kind of people my parents were, my dad, invented a grinder that he could attach to his bicycle. So in the winter, when it was freezing cold, he could turn our grain, which we'd grow into flour, which he would make into bread, which we would cook on our wood stove, which we would fill with wood from our land that we cut and burned on the fire. That's the same stove where we would heat our bath water, which we would share. (laughs) and would be pumped from our well outside. So the process of even taking a bath meant pumping water, bringing it indoors, heating it over a stove filled with wood that we grew and cut and burned. So it was a slow and very intentional and pretty challenging upbringing. Um, My mother is a healer. She's a body worker, energy worker, um, a PT uh, body worker. She's incredible. And so I really grew up paying attention to the body. And then my environment really had me paying a lot of attention to the land and to where we come from and how all those things mingle together. <laughs> wow. You're, you're, just to say your childhood, that just sounds so incredible. And I feel like it's almost, I don't know if you see this now, but I feel like in 2024, a lot of people are almost trying to go towards like that slower pace, (laughs) maybe not right to be the full extreme that you grew up in. But I think there is something in that slower pace that um, clearly has been informative to you. But I think that people are really searching for in this like fast pace, tech driven kind of culture we now live in. I think so too. I think we're all really hungry. We're hungry for presence we're hungry for connection. We're hungry for ourselves, I think. 
And there's certainly a draw to returning to nature to remember that we are nature. <laughs> that feels about as fundamental as it can be. Um, yeah. So you'd asked about the skincare. So the <laughs> how long I've been doing this. Well, it comes from that. As a kid growing up the way that I did, our nearest neighbors were miles away. Um, so I was largely by myself. I had an older brother. He was just 15 months older than me. So we were close enough in age to have nothing in common. <laughs> and, um, so my brother mostly spent the years avoiding me and I mostly spent the years uh, talking to myself as I played in the gardens and ran through the forest and digged up clay in our yard and made potions out of plants. And as a kid, that's what I did. Uh, a lot of time by myself, a lot of time making potions. Um, my mom would tell stories of leaving me in the morning and I would be mushing up plants in a bowl <laughs> with rocks and, and things. And she'd come home at the end of the day and I would have all these little glasses lined up filled with green liquids that I would have squeezed out of plants over the hours of the day um, that she was gone at work. And, you know, you could worry about your kid or you could cheer them on <laughs> in such a, such a circumstance. And I was really lucky. I had parents that um, cheered me on and they needed to, because it turned out that I had really severe skin challenges that I wasn't aware of until I left my little bubble of um, hippie cleandom, <laughs> I guess. Um, growing up, everything that I used on my skin was what you would expect based on my story. I am a Dr. Bronner's girl from day one. I still have Dr. Bronner's in my shower today. Um, other than that, it was a whole lot of avoiding. I learned very early that I could not even use regular soap. One of my earliest memories was being five years old. It was my first time uh, going to a friend's house for a sleepover by myself, unattended. And I was in the restroom washing up my hands before dinner. I went to reach for the soap. There was two bottles there. This was the late eighties. So there was the fragranced bubbly soap in a bottle, in a pretty bottle. And then next to it, the fragrance lotion. I'd never seen either of these things. This was wild to me. I traded goat soap with our neighbors. And <laughs> so I used the fancy pretty bottles. I put all the stuff in my hands and immediately they started burning. And I looked down and my hands were turning red in front of my eyes. I started yelling. My friend's parents ran into the room. I was mortified mortified. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what was happening. And I was in pain. And it turned out that I just had an allergy to soap, really basic soap ingredients, nothing crazy. It's surfactants, it's fragrance. It's what's in literally every soap everywhere <laughs> um, out in the world. And so that was my first experience really being uh, scared mm -hmm. in my skin really being unsure of um, my body's ability to be in the world. And it got worse from there. I went to school and had the same thing there. You can all imagine the pink soap. I, I even say pink soap. I'm sure you have a smell that just drops right into your mind. Um, I would go school shopping. I'd go to the mall once a year. We'd go to the mall to do the school shopping. And I couldn't walk through the aisles in Walmart to pick out clothes without getting rashes on my hands from uh, the different chemicals that are used for storage. Even just clothing held in warehouses is uh, sprayed with things and stored with things to prevent insects and um, mold and uh, such <laughs> such concerns in warehouses. Um, and so I couldn't even wear new clothing. So this went deep. Mm -hmm. And so for many years, all through childhood, it was don't touch this, don't touch that, um, being scared in my body. And as I got older, uh, I started to learn more about my own skin and my own skin history. It turns out it wasn't just me, this little child with skin problems, but my mom had my same skin. Her dad had her same skin. My grandmother had it too. This was genetic for me. Uh, there wasn't probably going to be an avoiding it coming into my view. This was going to happen for me. So well, I was going to yeah. just say, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, skin is such an interesting thing when we think about it because 
it's our, we know it's our largest organ. It's, we all have it. And it's sort of this barrier, right, that we have in how it interacts for like what it does kind of for the body and other parts of the body. But then also it's like the first thing to interact sort of with these outside external stimuli. stimuli. And, you know, I, I never had terrible allergies in the way that you're kind of talking about or reactions, but I had a period of time where I had really terrible skin. Like it kind of came out of nowhere. And just having, I think so many people can understand and, and f- kind of understand that like, it's not until you suffer with a skin related issue that all, all of a sudden you really understand like how it can impact, I think your emotional state too. Um, and as a kid, not be- being told like, don't touch that, don't touch that, that sort of like restrictive stuff that can, I'm sure weigh on you quite a bit. Um, how did you learn to manage that as that was something that you became aware of and that is something that, you know, your family experienced um, generationally also, but because your home life was so sort of like removed from that, some of that stuff and then interacting in the world in school and in, at the mall and those things, how did you learn to sort of manage that or relief? Was there any relief uh, for you from, from that? Well, oh, so many things I want to jump off there. <laughs> he, uh, I'm thinking about, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. When I was 18, we can go back in time if we need to, but I'm going to fast forward it by saying, so I grew up in that way with these hippie parents in this very kind of protected natural world. And then I'd go out in the rest of the world and would, couldn't touch anything, was allergic to everything, had my body, um, scream no at me in very obvious ways. Uh, That just continued. It amplified over my teenage years. That drew me to find myself in our little local library. It was reading all these different books on on plants and on uh, beauty rituals throughout history, the anthropology of beauty, what women have been using since the beginning of time to tend to their skin. What I do today is not really any different than any of them have been doing forever. It's all clays and salts and honey and butters and plants. And uh, that exists everywhere on every continent, on every, whether you're talking about South America or India or right here, we're gathering plants and clays and herbs to feed our skin. That's been going on forever. What I have access to today is literally the whole world. I don't have to grow it in my village. It doesn't have to be what I can walk to. We've got refrigeration. We've got various methods of preservation, all of that. So I'm not doing anything groundbreaking, but I have the whole world's influence. So as a little child, it was about avoiding things. As a teenager, I started to learn what I could actually feed back in, where I could actually make a difference. So I started really studying plants. My mother, um, her friends, she had wonderful girlfriends who were all herbalists and healers and special people. And they taught me lots about plants. And I had personal experience there, took lots of little local classes, Um, I remember very early taking a perfuming class, a natural perfuming class with my mom, and it was all just beautiful plant oils from one of her friends. It was a neighbor, uh, a local community class, and it was all these old ladies and me, and I was nine. (laughs) So from very early, I was exposing myself to things like that and learning from my elders. I was learning from women many generations ahead of me. I was always the only child in the room everywhere that I went. Um, and this continued through my late teens into my mid twenties. By my mid twenties, I was specifically focusing on acute skin conditions for people who came from far greater skin challenge than me. All the severe forms of psoriasis, eczema, dermatitis, rosacea. Um, many of my clients came from post-cancer, uh, post-chemotherapy, radiation, had lots of burns, scarring, rashes, dry skin, flakiness, all of the allergy that just comes from um, these treatments that are life-saving, but skin deteriorating and mentally and emotionally deteriorating. And okay, so I'm going to go back, <laughs> spring back again to my um, 
when I was 18, I'd left Minnesota. I'd left my hometown. I left early. I left a home just after 15, um, was on my own for the last couple of years in Minneapolis, um, and then left, left all the way in my car um, as an 18-year-old, found my way to California, lived in my car for many months um, out here. Uh, that story is available elsewhere. It would take me all day to tell. Um, but when my skin was at my worst was then living in my car in LA, eating from a women's shelter twice a week, um, no access to showering, no access to daily hygiene was not a thing. Uh, nutrition was out the window. I ate out of a paper bag, whatever canned foods had been donated. I was um, grateful for every bit of it, but my skin fell apart. Uh, at 18 years old, my whole body was covered in rashes. My arms from my hands, which were always my worst, the center of my palms would be fallout out blisters, bleeding um, all over my hands. I could never wear rings. I couldn't wear jewelry. All the way up my arms to my shoulders, I would sleep with men's socks pulled up over my shoulders every night um, because when I didn't, I would wake up and the bed would be full of blood. It was really bad. Um, for years after my arms were scarred, I would be in the grocery store and small children would cling to their mothers and ask what was wrong with me. It was really hard. I have the emotional stamp of being a five-year-old standing in that bathroom, washing my hands. I have myself as an 18-year-old in the grocery store, just being mortified, trying to exist in the eyes of other people, even children. And that took me to working one-on-one -on -one with people who had these kinds of skin conditions. So that's where I come from as a formulator is building formulas for people who had this. And what I would find over and over, I'd go into women's houses and they would not leave their, they would not leave their rooms. They didn't have any mirrors in their home. They wouldn't go out in public. There was no showing of the skin. And I remember learning in my own hands, this is going back to what you said about the emotional piece of skincare. If you haven't had skin issues, you don't know. It can just seem frivolous. It can just seem like another thing that someone's trying to sell you or trying to make a change of how you look. Or I tell you, it is so much deeper than that. And what I learned and that helped me a lot about the self-consciousness. I had such extreme self-consciousness that then I would judge myself for the self-consciousness because I felt vain. And I didn't want to be vain. I didn't want to <laughs> acknowledge that I was being vain. And so when I didn't want to leave my house and I wanted to cover up my skin, I told myself so many stories and they were gnarly. And what I learned was right underneath the skin surface is our nerves. And when you've got skin conditions like this, psoriasis, eczema, dermatitis, severe acne, and it's going into that layer of nerves, it's literally getting on your nerves. It's literally making you nervous. That is what it does. And so even if you're not leaving in your house, even if no one is ever going to see you, you will feel that in your body and it's real. It's physical. You are having a physical response to a physical happening in your body. Your body is telling you something. Me learning that changed everything because it took away the self-consciousness and the judgment and the shame around what I was feeling inside. Yeah. It's really powerful. You know, I... I've never, I don't think I've ever shared this on the podcast because my skin issues, I never had them on my face, but I had body acne and it was really, really shameful as a teenager, but I could cover it up, right? Like I just wouldn't wear anything that would show maybe my back or my chest or anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, eventually I, I guess as I got older and healthier and, you know, same, my, my long journey is on other episodes of the podcast, but I grew up food insecure. And so I'm sure it was just like crazy hormones and all this stuff from what we were eating. But I was still like, you, you remember those moments or even somebody once pointed out that was like, Erica never shows her chest or her back or like, just like little comments where you're like, wow, like, 
they stick with you, even if they're so small and the person doesn't realize what you might be hiding through what you're covering up. Or um, like you said, like the stares of people in the grocery, you know, it's it sticks with you, even if that's not necessarily their intention or they don't realize it. And it was actually through um, and I, I still have some scarring, actually. So it's you know, I don't I very rarely get a body breakout, usually around my cycle. That's where it'll still like pop out. But um, I do have some scarring and it was really healing actually because um, when I met my husband, which is now like 10, 12 years ago, 2012, which is I think when you launched your company, 2012. (laughs) Yes, it's a big year. People actually, (laughs) it's like wild. But um, meeting my husband and falling in love with my husband and the way he embraced all of me and all of my imperfections was such a, I know that sounds, it's it's all, it is about self-love and self-acceptance, but I also think like it was the first time I was really vulnerable to like show all of me to somebody and his acceptance and still, you know, it just, it was part of my healing process. And um, until I just heard your story, I don't think I connected how much, I don't know. I think there's certain things we're very conscious of. Like I have a self-love journey with my body and all of this stuff, but the aspect of kind of hiding my skin because it wasn't on my face, because it was easier for me to quote hide, it it still really impacted me. And so, you know, you mentioned working with people, right, from all over the spectrum, right? Like people who have gone through chemotherapy and radiation to burns to, to everything, what made you want to start working with people? So I, your journey is so fascinating, May. So you feel like we're going on this like journey together as listeners and podcasters. But so you come to California, you're having this experience, you're living in your car. How do you go then to being like, I'm going to, I'm going to help people heal the way I'm healing myself? We want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about BTR Nation. BTR is a female-founded food brand that is on a mission to end mindless snacking with their protein bars with a purpose. BTR bars and chocolate truffle cups are plant-based and made with no gluten, no dairy, no soy, no added sugar, no corn or rice syrups, no GMOs, no natural flavors, no sugar alcohols, no stevia, no inflammatory ingredients, and no gums or fillers. It's the cleanest label in the category. They only use ingredients that you can pronounce and adaptogenic superfoods like reishi, lion's mane, and cordyceps. Allie and I love BTR bars and always have them in our cabinets. I am currently loving the cinnamon cookie dough energy bars and the cherry dark chocolate truffle cups are my favorite sweet treat. Founder and owner Ashley Marie found inspiration for her brand in an unlikely place at an unlikely time at the hospital cafeteria. When both of her parents were diagnosed with cancer, her life turned upside down as she became their caretaker and her own nutrition began to suffer. Ashley was devouring protein bars when she could, as many of us do, to fit in a meal or a snack. Most of the bars she quickly discovered were filled with sugar. After her parents passed away, she founded her bar brand based on their family mantra, be bold, tenacious, and resilient, BTR. If you want to try BTR bars and truffle cups, you can save 20% on your order with code COURAGEOUSWELLNESS at btrnation.com. You can also find this link in our show notes and link tree on Instagram. (laughs) Well, I didn't plan to stay living in my car for as long as I did. (laughs) It could be considered a misstep. Uh, except when I look back and there's nothing messed up about it. It was so important. Um, it is when my skin was at its worst that gave me, I had accumulated some solid empathy over my lifetime for people with extreme skin conditions, but nothing compared to, um, the years between 18 and 20 or so for me, those few years were just brutal. And when I would go into, my clients' homes after that, I had such a different 
perspective. And I was young. I'm talking about myself at 18, 19, 20, and I was making these formulas. These ones. I was just thinking <laughs> the, the ones you you still are you still using, you're saying. There's variations yeah. of today's formulas were part of my toolbox. Wow. For more than a yeah, for for many years uh, beforehand, not the exact ones. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was going to be putting this on the shelf. Right. And that's a big part of it. For me, this started as very much my own personal journey. How can I just exist in the world in my own skin? There was nothing in me that thought I was going to bottle this and sell it all over the world decades later. That was not, that was not the MO. Uh, it was, how do I do today? How do mm -hmm. I do today? How do I do today? And then as a teenager, it was, how do I do today? And then as in my twenties, it was, how do I do today? And I kept thinking there was all these other things I was going to do with myself. I started working in restaurants when I was 12. I have always been in food. I was a chef for a long time. My business card still says skin chef. So I guess I haven't <laughs> quite given yeah. it up. Um, <clears throat> this is very much my background. Uh, so I always thought this was something that I would just do on the side. It was like my first language. It became my first love. I became really obsessed with it because I saw what it could do for my own self. It allowed me to be in relationship with my body and to have other people be in relationship with my body. You just spoke about your husband. And I just think, what about every person before that? What about every person before that? And for me, what about every time before I felt comfortable existing in my skin. I'm 40 years old. This is the healthiest my skin has ever been in my life. It can just get better and better and better from here. I say it all the time. Skin can heal. I've been blown away uh, by what can happen in our skin. I've seen monumental changes, not just in myself, but in so many clients over the years. So um, yeah, this was not, <laughs> this is not what I thought I was going to do. It was always just something in the background. Um, so when I... <clears throat> moved out to California, I assumed I would get a job. I'd been working for many years. I'd been living on my own for years already. Uh, what I didn't know, and this was 2001, was that I would need an in-state reference to get a job or an apartment. And I could get neither because I didn't have the other. I couldn't get a job without the address. I couldn't get the address without the job. I couldn't get any of it without an in-state reference. And I just had, I didn't know. I was unprepared. And so over time, just ran out of money. <laughs> and, uh, pardon. and so I was doing other things. I was actually working as a teacher um, during uh, my primary time, that first time in California. It took me moving to California three separate times for it to stick, but I've largely been here since 2001. And wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. So this is my, this, I call this my home state now, right next to Minnesota. <laughs> and uh so I was teaching, um, ironically, I was teaching life skills <laughs> to developmentally disabled adults. I had a classroom and uh, taught art therapy and life skills, um, reading, writing, using the bus, uh, transferring from wheelchair, speech therapy, totally unrelated <laughs> things to what I do now. Um, but on the side, I was always just researching and testing formulas. And everywhere I went, I'd be talking about this because when you're young and obsessed, that's how it goes. And so I would constantly meet someone who would go, oh, you have to meet my mother. You need to meet my aunt. You have to meet my husband. And then I would get match made with these people. I would meet with them individually, learn about their skin histories and create formulas specific to their concern using all of the plants and herbs and minerals and things that I've been using my whole life, really crafting specific formulas to address <clears throat> their conditions and did that just on the side forever. And I had so many hangups about making it anything more than that. One, I was working with people who were hurting. This was not beauty skincare. This was not about aesthetics. This was not, how do I get the glow? <laughs> this was uh, way more personal than that. And there wasn't a part of me that could make sense of how to charge for my service at the time. Mm -hmm. I was so grateful that 
these individuals were entrusting me with their care during such a delicate state. I had been a guinea pig for so many different uh, attempts at clearing my skin from all of mine, but I tried all of the conventional versions too. I was... <clears throat> a literal guinea pig for a number of different um, exploratory um, injections and shots and topicals for years that were brutal. And so when I would be working with somebody, I would just give and give and give and give, and I would make them a formula and I would feed it to them until their skin got better. <laughs> and, then, wow. and then they would tell someone and and I would move on. And for me, that's all I wanted to do. I wasn't trying to make a living out of this. <clears throat> it was years after that um, where I would, I would individually replenish some of my clients if they were insistent, but I really wasn't trying to bottle it. I wasn't trying to make it into anything. Um, I continued teaching until I ran out of steam and ran out of money, left California, went to Mexico for a chapter, got spit out the other side of New Orleans, went back to cooking into restaurants. Um, in New Orleans, I had a renewal of my own relationship to my body, my own relationship to my own beauty. Um, I followed an ad on Craigslist, ended up um, <laughs> in a chapter as a nude model for close to a decade um, there, accidental, and it took over as things do. Um, learning to be in my skin, learning mm -hmm. how to see myself. Being seen by an artist is a hell of a good way to do that. I highly suggest if you have um, unwinding of personal stories to do around mm. your skin or your body, uh, find somebody who looks at you like you're the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I did that for a while and that uh, it took me to New York. It took me back to LA. It took me on a number of different paths. Somewhere in there, I realized I'd accidentally left my time in the kitchen for time in front of the camera and had a five-year gap in my resume. Uh, that felt awkward. So I found my way back into, <clears throat> into the beauty world. I was doing, um, I was working on set as a makeup artist and decided if I'm not going to be in front of the camera, if that uh, <laughs> little stint is closed, which I was ready for, I could um, at least continue those relationships and be on set. And so for a while, I was showing up with, <laughs> I'd come to set with a tackle kit, like a fishing tackle kit with filled with all these oils and pigments. And I would basically just paint um, with mm -hmm. oils and, and pigments. And I don't know if either of you have explored the good stuff, <clears throat> but the good stuff is the most ridiculously sexy romantic potion of all time. It smells like sex and chocolate and love and it's insane. And I would bring it to set see my water glass is a quart jar. So I've been carrying around quart jars my whole life. And I would come to set with the good stuff in a quart jar, this gold swirling, shimmering, magical oil. And everybody would want to take that home. And so I would distribute these samples on set. And every day I'd go to work and people would go, May, you're an idiot. <laughs> if, you, if you don't start bottling this, we're just going to have to kick you off set because this is great, but that, that is the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they were right. And so I'd had a number of people over the years just tell me over and over and over that like, you've got to stop hiding. Like these formulas are the real deal. And there was something about my <laughs> real deal formulas, the really effective ones that people were hiding in their drawers <laughs> um, that I had too many hangups around personally to, to feel good about selling. I also just didn't see myself as a salesperson. I had a lot of insecurity around money. Um, growing up the way that I did, there was a lot of uh, internal and external self-talk around what money meant. And um, so I had a lot of holds and there was something about the good stuff because it felt a little frivolous it was sexy and playful and fun and universally loved. Um, it felt a little easier in some ways uh, to share with people. Yeah. But then when I did, so what happened is enough people <laughs> got in through the good stuff, were then introduced to the powerhouses behind it. 
And I found myself a designer on Craigslist. I love Craigslist. This was the time, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> and, uh, so in 2010, let me see, not even 2010, late 2009, I placed an ad on Craigslist looking for a designer to help me bottle the good stuff. I had the formula. I'd been carrying it around in these mason jars and distributing it in whatever small bottles and set. And I said, all right, I guess I need a logo. I guess I need an actual box. I guess I need to figure out um, all of the legal. Can I sell just this one? Maybe I'll sell just this one. And um, I ended up with the most perfect designer. He's been with me over 14 years. Wow. He predates my husband by like six weeks. <laughs> um, and he's wonderful. His name is Rodney Kizia. And yeah, we, we met on Craigslist. I sat at his side and pixel by pixel designed our logo and our packaging. And he's been with me ever since. Wow. And he was also a big part of telling me, I'm not just going to do one for you if we're going to go through all of this. Don't you have more formulas? And I was like, yes, all of the other ones are the real formulas. The good stuff is the showstopper to get me over my own insecurity around mm -hmm. sharing it. Thank you so much for sharing that part of your story. What I what I think is really valuable in sharing that is that when we listen to, you know, it's it's easy to look at these, you know, your line now and it's so beautiful. It's luxurious. It's they're wonderful. Um, but to hear like these non-linear journeys, because most are not linear, I think is actually quite empowering for people because this isn't, this wasn't an over overnight thing. This has been clearly something like lifelong work and that's evolves and that your environment sort of kind of nudged you into this mission that you have in it. And, um, and to just hear that and understand it and know that like, even the experiences I think that we have that are not like in, for your, in your case, for example, like your teaching experience and your sh cooking experience and all these things, it's not like they don't all inform each other too. And even getting that period of time where you were able to be a model for artists. And um, I was laughing because I always remember in college, that was the most coveted job was to be a new nude model for the art department because it paid the highest. <laughs> it was like the highest on-campus job, highest paying on-campus job. Um, but but to have all these kind of components to your experience that somehow at some point, you know, all, all sort of inform what then has now transformed into May Lindstrom skin and all the formulas that you do offer now. And, um, and Erica and I have gotten to try some of your products. They're so luxurious. I mean, just um, the smells alone, I have to say. Uh, and I'm someone who really, uh, I also, I try to avoid, um, you know, certain sort of chemicals. And, and I really try to strive for a simplicity and um, and things that I know are going to be good for my skin because of so having a history with with skin issues in the past. Although I've been okay for about like I'm going on 15 years now, but it was like my early 20s. I Ooh. mean, I had like a really terrible time. And um, I remember crying, not wanting to go out and being in so much physical pain because of developing cystic acne. And so so I just I just really appreciate what you've been able to do with with these uh, these formulas and how good it feels. And there's a ritualistic part of it too, when you get the privilege of getting to use them. And so um, I don't know. I'd love to go into if if any of our listeners are not familiar with your line, can you share with us a little bit about? what you do offer and sort of the intention behind um, behind some of the skincare ritual that goes along with it? I can. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're slow movers, <laughs> I would say. Mm, we launched our website. When I say we, I'm making shit up. That was me. I <laughs> singular way back. <laughs> so from the beginning, these have been my formulas. So since I was a kid, I've been making the formulas they've refined and more and more and more over the years. When, when I finally decided to really sit down and make Maylinstrom real, 
real, real, not hidden in my bottles, not, you know, taken between sets or hidden on the side or <laughs> slipped away to the people that needed it. Um, when I stopped hiding and sat down with my designer and said, I'm doing this, we're going to make, we're going to make a collection. This is going to be my Lindstrom skin. I'm going to put my name on it. It was a big deal. The first four formulas were the good stuff, that, that body oil that changed everything, um, along with the problem solver, which really it holds up to its name. That was my oldest formulas. I've been using variations on that for more than two decades. It's a combination of different clays, salts, spices, um, really, really incredible, powerful formula. Um, it's no joke. You'll want to read all of the directions. You want to know everything there is. It gets warm. It's tingly. I almost didn't share this one um, because it's, it's intense. It's real deal. It's not dumbed down for the market, but it's so wonderful for sensitive skin, for red skin, for acne, for psoriasis, for dermatitis, all of the conditions where people go, I can't put anything on. Um, I'm going to tell you to put this on and it's going to be scary for those of you who have skin like mine, because it's all the things that we normally avoid. It's, it's heat, it's stimulating, it's, uh, it's messy, <laughs> it is a pain in the ass and it's worth it. Um, the clean dirt is similar in formulation. It's another powder, um, both the clean dirt and the problem solver. They're these concentrated, dried, super fresh, um, plant-based formulas. So they're wild. You blend them with just under equal parts water and they bubble and fizz and pop up, puff up into this mousse consistency. Um, they sound like rice krispies. The actual process of doing it is pretty cool too. Um, and it's a pain in the ass, but not really. It takes like 30 seconds to fresh blend your treatment. And then I'm not selling you water. I'm not selling you preservatives. I don't have to put any of that shit in there, frankly, that hurts people. It hurts people. It's not in there because it doesn't work for me. And not everyone. There are so many people, large, large portions of the population that can use literally anything. Hey, go to town. Lucky you. I wish I could walk into Walgreens and spend $6 on skincare made of whatever. Um, I can't. And so it's not what I make. Um, so the problem solver and the clean dirt were our two powerhouse treatments right out the door. The good stuff is the body oil. And then the youth do, which is still with us today, still top seller. Um, people are obsessed. It's was the only moisturizer that we launched with and the only one for the first couple of years until the blue cocoon, which, um, comes later. So youth do is ridiculous. Uh, Two years or so after those first four, I mean, the brand blew up right away. I had no idea that would happen. Um, definitely not a guarantee. We launched our website November of 2011. Um, in January of 2012, we got all of our boxes <laughs> and all of the perfect pieces put together. Um, so that was January 2012. And then my daughter, our first child, was born um, July 31st of 2012. And on August 1st, we launched with our first retailer one day following my first baby's birth at home. And so if you look on my phone, <laughs> there's uh, July 30th, I'm mixing in my studio. July 31st, there I am laying on the floor next to my dog in labor. Um, and then there's the first, and there's a screenshot of um, the first email from someone else talking about us to the world. And um, so from there, it really picked up fast. So in, I believe it was 2014, the Blue Cocoon and the Honey Mud were launched on the same day. The Blue Cocoon is our most iconic formula. Everybody knows of us for the Blue Cocoon now. And that formula, that formula changed the world. Really, it changed my own skin um, in ways I can't even describe. Just a, a lifetime apart, I waited decades to know what I know now with that one and um, by far our most talked about and, and popular product. And especially, especially for people who have any kind of redness, any kind of sensitivity, dehydration, um, psoriasis, eczema, dermatitis, rosacea, all of that. It's the prettiest, most fancy, most spa feeling, indulgent, luxurious formula ever. And the most perfect moisturizer for everybody. But if you have challenged skin, this is food. This is, this is a daily nutrient. It's a whole different ball game of efficacy. Yeah. I have a question too, because we love 
your products so much. Um, as Ali mentioned, they're so luxurious. They smell incredible. And um, it's a real pleasure to put on your skin as a ritual. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, we love it. And we've been using it now for a couple of months. And, and just, again, the, the results and the, the powerhouse of these ingredients, which I'd love to talk about too. But something interesting about um, the application of your products, which is uh, different than most, is you put it on damp skin, right? So you mm -hmm. blend it into, can you talk about that a little bit? Because even myself selfishly, I'm like, am I <laughs> doing like how damp is damp, right? Um, and why damp skin, right? Like why do we use why do we apply it with the damp skin? And can you just talk about that for a little bit? Cause I'm so curious. <laughs> oh, there's a couple of reasons. Okay. So <sighs> a picture of cream first. All right. So people love creams. Why do they love creams? Because they actually both moisturize they're, they're good for both dry skin and dehydrated skin. And those are different. Like one needs water, one needs fat. So you can be, you can have dry skin or you can have dehydrated skin and to meet the needs of either, really you need both. You need the waters and you need the fats. The problem is I can give you the absolute best, most ridiculously fresh, gorgeous, potent oils on the planet. But if I add water to that bottle, I have to also add a preservative. I have to add several probably in order for it to really fully be full spectrum protection to not grow things that you don't want on your skin. And so, I don't know, I would rather give you the best oils on the planet that I can source right to where they're grown, when they're grown, <laughs> the insane amount of obsession that we put into our sourcing. I can do that for oils. I don't have the ability to do great quality control on extras on fillers, on preservatives. None of that is actually of benefit to the skin other than keeping it fresh. And so if I were to make an oil and water formula for you today and you could use it today, stunning. But if I'm going to make an oil and water for you today and you wanna use it six months from now, I'm gonna to have to add a bunch of stuff that my skin personally doesn't like. So for me, I skip all that I give you the best of the best of the best, and then I get out of the way, which means the blue cocoon, the yeast do, the good stuff, the happy galaxy, the pendulum potion, no water, all oils, all butters, all the best of the best of the best. No, it's just not diluted. Mm -hmm. It's not diluted. There's no filler. It's the best ingredients on the entire planet sourced at their height of potency meticulously processed. And we're giving you this year's batch, this year's. And then it comes to us as fresh as fresh can be. And in our private studio right here in Los Angeles, we blend and fill every small batch. Every single bottle and jar gets its own birth date on the bottle. You see exactly when it's made. That's for you, not for some retailer who can leave it there for three years. <laughs> it's for you, your visibility into our intimate process. And then you serve it to your skin fresh. And so you take these beautiful, beautiful oils, but what do you still need? Water. You still need the water. <laughs> yeah. So just because I'm not putting it in the bottle doesn't mean you don't need it there. And so the best way for it actually to get into your skin, if I had a Vitamix, I, and if I had a Vitamix in front of me right now, or just a great blender, I could take a jar of the Blue Cocoon and a bottle of the Used to and a bottle of the Jasmine Garden. That's our Hydration Hero Trio. That's our ridiculously stunning balm, but balm with no waxes, no fragrance, no any of the shit that's normally in a balm, all pure, beautiful plant butters. That's the Blue Cocoon. They used to 21 of the most beautiful plant oils on the planet in their freshest, most powerful state. And then the Jasmine Garden, this gorgeous watery base of colloidal silver, rose cellular water, and the most stunning array of plant um, essences. So if you put those three products together, our oil, our balm, and our mist in a Vitamix and whipped it up, you would have the single most beautiful cream on the entire planet. It's stunning. I've done it. <laughs> it's absurd. Um, if I was able to use preservatives, 
boy, I would just add that to that mix, send that off to testing and sell you the most ridiculous cream there ever was. It's better like this. It is better when each of those can shine on their own without any fillers, without any extra preservatives, without any irritants. And so you use them together and you are the blender. <laughs> so you don't have to be a Vitamix. <laughs> Your skin will take in what it needs. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece is I want you to picture a kitchen sponge, just a blue basic kitchen sponge. So when that sponge is dry, it's crispy like a piece of French bread, right? That same sponge, you get it wet and now it's soft, okay? So if you were to try to sweep up spilled olive oil with the crispy sponge, how would that go? Oh, Not well. so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like dipping French bread in oil. It stays right. on the outside. Nothing's really happening there. You take that same sponge and you put it under warm water and you squish it with your hands. Now suddenly it's absorbent. It, yeah. It's absorbent. And you put that over the olive oil and the olive oil is going to just drink right up into the sponge. So your skin while not actually porous in that way, behaves in the same way. And so when you go over the water, you can feel the sensation in your fingertips. When you go to rinse your face, whether that's in the morning, you're just waking up and you're splashing your skin with warm water, you can feel the sensation when your skin changes texture and starts to soften. Mm. Makes sense. Like there's outside skin. It's like you have paper on your skin and then you get it soggy and now it's soft. <laughs> yeah. And now you can actually get your moisturizers to go in there. If you just put an oil or a balm on top of that dry skin, it's literally like putting it over paper. You have this protection there. Your skin mm -hmm. is doing what it's supposed to do. It's barriering, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, barrier, it's being a barrier. It's barriering. Um, but what you really wanted to do is sponging. <laughs> and so you need to treat your skin like that sponge, infuse it with the water. We don't need to sell you that. You have that. Go in your shower. I do almost all of my skincare in the shower because that is when your skin is most prepped. Your mm. hands are super, super clean. Also, if you are prone to any kind of skin issues, don't touch your face ever unless your hands are super, super, super clean. All of that bacteria, all of that just goes right in there. And so in the shower, your hands are the cleanest, your face is the cleanest, everything gets soft, gets mushy, gets receptive. From there, whether you're, it's time for your cleanser or your exfoliant, those are all gonna work way better on steam softened, <laughs> saturated skin. Um, and then when you're through those steps, you wanna stay there. Stay right in the shower. I keep the blue cocoon and the youth do in the shower with me. People think that's insane, but what's insane is putting it on your counter and wasting that result. Get it on your skin while it's wet, while it's ready and massage it directly into the waters. And so it looks a little funny. It feels a little funny if you've always just towel dried after cleansing and then put on a moisturizer. Skip that. One, you're pressing towel into your face, which just knock that off altogether. That also full of bacteria that you're just pressing into your skin when it is most clean. So hands off, cleanse yourself, leave yourself wet, whether you're at the sink or in the shower, do your cleansing, leave the water on your skin, and then massage your oils or your butters, the blue cocoon or the youth do directly into the water on your skin. It adds all this slip. It gives you so much flexibility for massaging, really getting deep into the tender areas, um, being able to be lighter on those more sensitive areas. If you have perioral dermatitis or any kind of skin, skin sensitivity that makes massage a little trickier for you, it's easier to glide around those areas while still feeding in uh, that moisture and those beautiful oils. Um, and if you really love the massage, that extra slip with the water and the oil is everything. Um, yeah. and you'll just feel it every, you can feel your skin plump up with it. The, the difference is night and day. Yeah, you absolutely do. I can say from experience. And do you recommend, is it the blue cocoon and then the youth do is that, or does it, is the does the order matter? <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions. It depends. You really can't mess it up. Number one, okay. the ingredients are good enough. You can't mess it up. Even if you did it on dry skin, you can't mess it up. It's a win, 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 win. When you start with ingredients, this good. But if you're going to invest in skincare this good, and frankly, this expensive, you should get absolutely everything out of it. And so the tips really do make a huge difference. Between the youth or the blue cocoon, I say this. 
I love both of them. And if I could give both of them to every person on the planet, I would. I think they work best when they dance together. They fill totally different needs. They operate in different ways. They're so beautifully complemented to each other. That said, if you had to pick one, mm. and this is the same way you decide which goes first, <laughs> is yeah. if you have skin that is more red, more sensitive, more finicky, everything pisses it off, everything hurts, um, you're dry, that's the blue cocoon. You want to mm -hmm. go there first. If your skin is more oily, more congested, um, maybe you're more mature, you're more concerned about lines, tension, uh, you want more glow, that's the used to. Got it. So I don't know. I want both. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've got the skin that goes a little red. I still am a little prone to redness, still a little prone to sensitivity. Um, I live in California. It gets dry here. Um, those things are still very much going on. The blue cocoon is for sure my personal hero. My, uh, my, the foundation of my skin says mm. yes, yes, yes to the blue cocoon all day and all night. However, <laughs> I will not skip the used to um, because of how it makes my skin look. It's yeah. so wonderfully um, brightening and really does bring the glow. It's this gorgeous bright orange color. It's loaded with beta carotene, um, coenzyme Q10, C buckthorn. It's stunning and really, really brings out the life. So instant result if you've got lines and tension and congestion. Also, if you have oily skin or you think that you don't like face oils, you've never met a face oil you liked. <laughs> um, yeah, the youth do is your girl. Um, yeah. It's my favorite because people think that they're not going to be into a face oil and then it's all over. So no, apologies in advance. <laughs> that's great. Selfishly, I wanted to make sure I was doing it right because I have been using the blue cocoon mm -hmm. and then the youth do and then the facial mist. And so I was like, okay, but the, the, the combo together is just incredible. I, I do it. I do the youth serum first and then the blue cocoon. Mm -hmm. But I let, yes. well, I think I'm more concerned about like wrinkles <laughs> at this point <laughs> than redness. So that works but it's, for me. It's great That's, to know that they all, like it all you, compliments. Like you, you can't mess it up mess because it up. this is all like you're the blender. And I kind of love that visual. And I love that makes so much sense to me because like you said, if you are investing in products for your skin, you, you, why not be the blender yourself? Why pay for fillers? Because there are so many expensive products on the market that have so much filler in them. And it's kind of shocking. I'm, I'm a TikTok girl and you can see the <laughs> breakdown, like these, uh, TikTok skincare, like scientists will like literally break down the ingredients in, in certain like ridiculously expensive products. And it, it's blown my mind, you know? So I, uh, yeah, I love your products and, you know, before we begin to wrap up, because we could talk to you forever. And this is your, again, just to reiterate what Ali said earlier, I think your journey is incredible and I'm sure has been so valuable to hear for, for myself, but also for our listeners, because it isn't linear, right? You've gone through all of these different avenues and here you are with this beautiful skincare company that is really helping people. And I'm curious because as you mentioned at the top of the interview, right, that you've just entered your fourth decade of life. Completed fourth decade. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Like, You're, technically I'm in I my fifth, fifth decade. decade. <laughs> fifth decade, yeah. Um, okay. I tend to be about a decade ahead of what I think I am. You know, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I still think I'm 20. I'm like, I still think I'm 60. I'm just so, I'm always at least a decade or two behind and I'm waiting yes. for my numbers to make sense. Well, so <laughs> I'm curious, is there like a piece of advice that you feel has been a through line for you through your journey or something you mentioned, right? Just one day at a time. Is there any advice you'd like to offer our listeners or wisdom that you've taken from these five decades? <laughs> I just feel like my skin has always known, you know, and that can, I don't even know how to explain those words, but my whole life, my skin has known things that the rest of me hasn't. It's given me messages that I otherwise wouldn't have known. It's given me signals that I otherwise would not have heeded. It's informed how my path has gone the whole time. And that's when it's been difficult and scary and hard and painful, it's shaped 
it's shaped my way. And when it's been uh, glowy and attention getting and people are asking, what is she using? Um, it has shaped my way there too. And it's been a consistent dialogue for a long time. That first memory I described washing my hands, I was five years old, I'm 40. That's 35 years that I have been telling that story, not just to myself, but to other people. And it's changed how I connect to the world. And every day my skin has something to tell me. That's true as much today as it was 35 years ago. And I'm still learning to listen all the time. I, on my Instagram at Maylinstrom Skin, I will often just talk about little things like you asked today, like how do you feel that texture in your skin? How do you know when it's time to massage in the product or do something? It's all these other little, it's, these, it's this coming back to the skin. It's coming back to the relationship with the skin. It's coming back to the senses, uh, using the messages from my skin as, as that callback to return here and to tend to myself, I think that continues to be incredibly important. I solved the formulas a long time ago. What I'm doing now is <laughs> the same thing as I've always done, which is figuring out how to do today in this skin. And I know what I'm gonna put on it. I know <laughs> that what's up to me is how I treat myself while I'm in it. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to say too, you said something earlier that I can relate to. I'm going to be 38 in like a month and a half ish. And, um, you know, it's interesting because there's so much focus on like, I, I hate this word, but like it's a lot of marketing of like this anti-aging stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you said something like our skin can improve actually as we get older. Mine certainly mm -hmm. has. You have absolutely beautiful skin. I know we're on audio, but for anybody, <laughs> she's got stunning skin. And, and I think that's a beautiful way to look at just like, you know, the aging process. I think it's really a privilege to be able to age in the skin that we're in because, because it means we're alive. We have another day. Right. And, um, and so with that though, I love the idea that it can, it can and will get better. It's not all about like, well, it's downhill from here. So what are you going to buy to make it like less bad, you know? And then I think our bodies and the cells in our bodies can also, um, improves, you know, as we get older too, it's, it doesn't all have to be doom and gloom and yeah, our bodies change and that's okay. But I just, I love that, that you shared that too, that it, it also can improve and get better and in, in different ways. So thank you for sharing that. And, um, as we begin to wrap up, we, we always ask three wrap up questions. So I'm going to ask the first with a little spin on yours. So we ask our guests, what your daily self-care is and do you have any non-negotiables for yourself? And I'd love to ask you too, if you wouldn't mind throwing in just a little bit about your daily skincare in addition to your self-care. <laughs> mm. At 35, I learned that I had a body <laughs> and I think that's true of a bunch of us. There's something about 35. Um, I think it's because, <laughs> wow, this is an aside. You can edit if there's, if you want, but it's funny. Um, when I was a child, I remember as a kid overhearing that our sexual peak was at 35 as women. And I was probably like, you know, eight <laughs> when I heard this, <laughs> not even knowing what that means. But wow, was I looking forward to 35 um, because I, I heard there was something up there, right? Like at 18, there's some benefits and 21, there's some benefits and 25, you can rent a car, but at 35 sexual peak, don't know what that is, but I'm on board. And <laughs> oh shit. No, I forgot the question. <laughs> your daily, <laughs> your daily self-care or your daily skincare. <laughs> hmm.
I was just going to say, I just turned 35. So that's great. I'm like so <laughs> oh, happy to hear that. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now I'm back. That's what it was. The sexual peak at 35. And so I was looking forward to it for a long time. And then 35 came. And and actually, yes. Um, but <laughs> maybe 40 is even better. <laughs> um, 40 is better. Well, okay. So at 35, my sister-in-law and invited me by text to do a 30-day yoga challenge. So at 35, after 35 years of telling myself I'm not an athlete, I didn't really have a connection to my body, I had so much dissociation between the skin stuff and body image that went with that, what I looked like, um, there was a reason that I needed to be in front of the camera for a number of years to be able to see myself at all. And it wasn't until 35, after decades of thinking about what other people thought I looked like or you know, changing my body in all the ways for what was presenting to the world that I started to really discover my body for myself. And it started with showing up every day and I made a five minute a day commitment to being on the mat. And when I say being on the mat, sometimes that was literal, roll out of bed, get on the yoga mat. I would put it next to my bed. Um, and and I would just roll around for five minutes. Maybe I'd watch a video on YouTube. Maybe I would just lay there and listen to a song, but I would be on that mat for five minutes a day. And I did that every day, every day, every day, every day. And over a period of time, I started layering in other parts that made it feel good. I'd, I'd light a candle, I'd light some incense, I'd bring a dry brush, I'd do some, you know, some other things. And I, on purpose, committed to five minutes a day with my body every day. And it's been over five years now I'm doing that. And now I'm super strong. I never knew I was an athlete, but I have this body that I love to be in, um, which did tie into a far better sex life starting at 35. So I'll say <laughs> real sexual peak might be um, very dependent on making that commitment first, which for me, uh, it took that number for me to remember that if this is my peak, it should be all downhill from here. And I thought that was nonsense. Um, it actually got much better once I gave it the focus. So still my commitment to myself every day with my body, I wake up and I'm on the mat for five minutes. I'm also totally okay with that being, I'm in bed for five minutes, imagining myself doing yoga for five minutes. <laughs> the mental checking in and showing up for the habit is just as much a part. Sometimes the day goes by and it's 1130 at night and I pass out into the bed and I go, oh shit, I missed it. But I will do down dog in my head, in in the bed and imagine myself doing it. And it really makes a difference for the showing up of the habit without shame. That was game changing for me. So I still have that at least five minutes a day, every day I move my body. I dance, I shake, I uh, still mostly watch YouTube videos in my pajamas. I don't go to classes, but I have this commitment to myself that's unbreakable. With the skin, <sighs> I feed it well. I feed it well. I treat it like every other part of me that needs to be fed. There's not a day when I wake up and wonder if water is optional. There's not a day where I decide to leave the vegetables off the plate. And I feed my skin. Sometimes for me, feeding my skin can actually mean skipping a cleanse um, because I'm sensitive. Feeding my skin really just means listening. Feeding my skin is the same thing as being an actively involved in my body, that five minute a day commitment to my body. It does not matter what it is that I'm doing on that mat physically. It matters so much what's going on with me on that mat emotionally, spiritually, connecting myself in that way. Yeah. So when I come to the sink, when I find myself in the shower, it's about returning to the water. It's about returning to my own sense, my own touch, my own presence with myself, whether that's with products or not with products, it really doesn't matter. It's that, that ongoing, here I am, this is me here now in this body. What a precious, precious body it is. And just remembering that my mm. whole world now is about, about that, it's bringing us back to, to here. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And the next question we always ask is, what does being courageous mean to you? <laughs> That's courageous. Waking up every day and deciding yeah. to really, really be present in in these precious bodies of ours. It it can feel very scary. Yeah. And it could be very brave to love yourself out loud like that, actively like that. Love is an action verb. Absolutely. I love that. 
The final question is, do you have a book recommendation for any of our listeners? It can be like, it can truly be on anything, just something that's meant something to you along, along your journey. I do. Last year, my friend Jules Davis put out her book. It's called The Kitchen Healer. And I loved it. I have a morning practice along with my five minutes of rolling around on a mat of um, waking up and reading just a few pages of something that inspires. And so often it's, it's a poetry book or some, <laughs> something that can be easily dropped into and read a little section, um, plant some warmth into my conscious and subconscious as I start the day, sometimes having a little, um, extra copy <laughs> in there floating around to mix in with my internal dialogue is good. And Jules's book, um, is special, I think that she speaks to the relationship with the kitchen with food, the way that I speak to the relationship with the skin and our relationship to, um, tending to it. Mm. I went to her, uh, her book release and a lady in the audience stood up and said that Jules changed her life when she taught her to boil an egg. Wow. And yeah. it struck me because I have women in their sixties and seventies daily telling me that I changed their life when I showed them how to massage their face. Yeah. These women who were taught never to touch their fin- their face with more than a ring finger, the gentlest, <laughs> softest touch are now doing, you know, massage inside their mouths in the shower while they're cleaning, in, clean, dirty their armpits, you know, these, um, we get to see people break open and, um, listening to this woman talk about how she'd just been intimidated to even go into the kitchen. Um, yeah. because of so many complicated, um, aspects, learning to just boil a perfect egg at midlife and how empowering something as simple and foundational as that is. I talk to people about how to wash their face. I can't think of anything more foundational. And I will tell you that the people who have been most impacted by this are the women in their fifties and sixties and seventies and eighties who are now just now finding this pleasure in their skin, finding connection in their skin. It's the coolest. It's the best. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. I mean, I think that's really empowering. If anybody is listening, I hear this all the time too, where people are like, I don't know how to blanket, take care of myself, right? Like maybe from whatever childhood experiences they had, or they just weren't taught or they weren't curious. And now in their thirties or forties or fifties or sixties, they're learning to cook, to, 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 to grocery shop, to wash their face. And so I think even just you sharing that and anybody listening, it gives so much permission of like, we're not alone. And so thank you. Thank you for everything you shared today. This was such a great episode. It was such a pleasure getting to know you as a person in addition to your beautiful line. And so if anyone wants to find you, follow you, shop your skincare, where can they do all of the things? (laughs) <laughs> do all of the things. Maylindstrom.com is the very best. M-A-Y-L-I-N-D-S-T-R-O-M.com. That's where you can shop with us fresh from our kitchen lab. Everything is shipped to you right from where we make it. Um, it's really special. The website is ridiculously beautiful. We really, really pride ourselves on intimacy and relationship and um, connect with us care at maylinstrom.com if we can support in any way. Thank you, May. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Courageous Wellness. Tune in every Wednesday for a new episode featuring a different guest each week. Subscribe, rate, and write us a nice review. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Courageous Wellness or get in touch via our website, www.courageouswellness.net, where you can also find additional info about our health coaching services, virtual group events, newsletter, and more. Until next week, I'm Allie. And I'm Erica, and we're Courageous Wellness.